Hi, my name is Hope Rieger, and I am a founder facilitator of Grief to Hope, a support program, virtual grief support program, as well as a published author of Grief to Hope. I'm so excited to be here with Pearl today. Hello, sunshine. Good to see you again. Had to walk out to let you back in. Stuck in a storm of a relationship. Lost my fire. Oh, and I forgot about me for way too long. But it's rolled on. Now there ain't no shade around here. Won't you leave? another conversation with Pearl. And we are so excited to have a really special lady that I met over the past few months. A lot of you know the story of me, my loss of our son, Matthew. And I met Hope through social media and through contacts. And um, I'm so excited to bring her to you today. So if you are somebody that has recently lost a loved one, and that might trigger you, you may want to skip this episode. But if you really want to be inspired today, I would hope that you still push through it and join us because Hope Rieger lives in in Zenia, Ohio, and we're praying I said that right, with her husband, Mike. She has two sons, Brian, 33, and Justin, forever 19, and three amazing granddaughters, Halen, Addie, and Riley. Hope's day job is a talent coordinator and a major financial institution for the past 26 years. That's really cool. It's awesome. Hope believes her purpose in life was given to her after the traumatic loss of her son to murder. The purpose is to provide positivity, inspiration, and hope to others through Grief to Hope program that she created in honor of her son. And the Grief to Hope program is a virtual peer grief support group that allows grievers a safe space to be in their authentic self with support of others who understand and know exactly what they're going through. One of Hope's quotes she likes to end each session with is, Grief changes your entire world. It can also inspire and change your world. And oh my gosh, I have learned that over the past five months, which I cannot believe it's been five months already since Matt passed. And I truly have learned that. And you know, I, those that are listening, I fought my coach on going on TikTok. I did not want to be on TikTok at all. And (laughs) so I've been on there now. And the really cool thing, Hope, is like I've been sharing my story of the loss of Matthew and the different emotions that I go through and, and, you know, how that feels. And I am so excited to have you on today to share your story and share your family story and what you've, what you've done. So just tell us a little bit about yourself and then um, let's talk about your nonprofit as well and what you do. What's your, what's your corporate world too? Cause that sounds exciting as well. So absolutely. I, and I agree with you. Sharing our story is so impactful to so many. And we just don't know who you're going to, who's going to hear you tell your story and what impact it's going to make. So that's one of my biggest things. Just share, share, share if you can. Um, so yeah, a little bit about me. I'm born, bred in Ohio. Um, I have, um, Two beautiful sons, like you said, 33, Brian just turned 33, and Justin's forever 19. Um, gorgeous granddaughters. Um, one's a redhead, one's a dark head, and one's we don't know yet. She's like nine months sort of in between. Um, but my son is redhead, and I had a redhead and a dark head. Um, I have one sister, and uh, my parents live close by. They're divorced, but they live close by. Um, and then my husband. Uh, Mike, he works um, as in a prison um, and has for a very long time. And so, yes, I, I've got some unique stories on that side. But um, that's we do so much together as a family. Uh, we're very close knit. Um, my immediate family and I. Um, I've been working for that major financial institution for 26 years. Started out as a teller, and now I get to bring on new hires. So I'm sort of the first person that they run into when they come in to work. Um, so it's exciting kind of time. I do a lot of career development. 
Um, so that's just me in a little nutshell. I love, I love that you said that little nutshell. <laughs> I love that. And I love that you, you know, you shared about the, the, you get to create those dreams for those jobs, right? I think that's so powerful. So let's talk about, you know, you and I really connected and I, I've reached out to, we've talked before about coming through the loss of our, my son, Matthew, who's only been five months. I just, I can't believe how, how fast time flies. Right. Yes. So, so tell us about a little bit about your story, your family and about your son and and how that, you know, like that pay it forward. That's why I feel like what I'm going through, I feel like I need to pay it forward because so many came to me to pay forward to me when we lost Matthew about this is what you're going to go through. And, oh, you're going to get bills in the mail because he's 18. You don't have to pay those bills. Like, oh, OK, that was yeah. good to know. Like those kind <laughs> of things. So Right. So yeah. share us about your story and tell us about your son and how it led you to your grief to hope. Absolutely. Um, so my son, Justin, was 19 years old, and I had moved from my hometown of Xenia to Columbus for my job. And um, Justin, being a 19-year-old kid, did not want to move to a different town. Um, so we, he went back and forth between hanging out with his friends, his, his, uh, his dad's house, my house. He was back and forth. And he made a move in September of 2016. He was like, mom, I'm, I'm going to stay with, you know, a buddy of mine and we're going to live. And we're going to, you know, get this great job. And I'm, you know, da, da, da. all those big uh, dreams of a 19 year old house, as you, as you know. Um, and so I was like, okay, you know, and so we talked every day. And I, most of the time it was like, mom, do you have some money for McDonald's or mom, do you have some food? It's usually, you know, that, but we talked each and every day, but in the um, September, end of September, he moved in um, and I had met up with him um, at that house. I never went into the house and I didn't know the roommate that he was moving into. I was not familiar with him whatsoever, but he claims he was an old friend of a friend. So um, in November of 2016, I get a knock at the door um, and it's simply the police. Um, and at 6.30 in the morning, I'm thinking, what has that kid done, right? That's what I'm thinking, he's 19, what has he done, right? And so I answered the door and they basically said, are you, you know, Justin's mom? And then I knew I was like, yes, you know, and I'm thinking he's gotten in trouble. He doesn't have his cell phone. He can't get a hold of me, you know, and they handed me a piece of paper, Pearl, that just had a name and a number. And so I was like, do you know what this is about? And the gentleman said, or the police officers said, no, we have no idea, but they want to, they need to get a hold of you. And so I was like, okay, you know, and I thanked them and I shut the door and I went upstairs to get ready. Um, Cause again, it's 6.30 in the morning and I'm thinking nobody's gonna answer the phone at 6.30 in the morning um, on a weekday. But I went ahead and dialed the number and the person said Green County Corner. And I assumed I had dialed the wrong number. And um, I was like, you know, I don't, I'm sorry. I think I have the wrong number. And he was like, is this Justin's mother? And I said, yes. And he says, I'm so sorry to do this on the phone, but um, your son has passed. And I said, what? I think you have the wrong Justin. Like I literally was in that like shock awe kind of feeling. And he proceeded to tell me what had happened. He had gotten into an altercation with his roommate and they were yelling back and forth, verbally started fighting, fist fighting. And the roommate pulled a gun on Justin, even though Justin didn't have a weapon and shot him directly in the chest. So this happened at 1.30 in the morning and this was 6 30 in the morning so i'm freaking out thinking what has happened to my child where is he at and all that goes through and i think you probably would understand this as a mom is like i have to get to him to fix it right like i can fix this as a mom right and i was so worried about him being cold and that just ran through my mind and so as the time moved on and things that I finally got to realize what had happened and I got home and 
there were so many different things that you go through, you know, as you know, when, you know, something tragic or death. And so in the midst of all of this, there's a murder investigation because he says that he, he murdered Justin. He admitted it. Um, and so two to three months down the road, um, he went to the grand jury and they allowed him to file self-defense. No um, charges were brought against him. So that's when I decided I had two choices. I could, and th we're talking months, like I'm angry as hell. I'm mad as hell. I'm mad at everybody. I'm hateful. I'm, I'm just, I'm pissed. And I end up deciding two choices where I could either sit in that hatred and that that frustration and that negative energy and lay in bed for the rest of my life. And not one person would question that, right? Not one person would question it. But it eventually I said, Hope, that is not the way that you lived or he lived. And you need to get your butt out of bed and you need to fight and live for him and honor him in a way that he lived versus the way that he was taken. And that sort of like brought me through all those processes. And that was, you know, shortly after he passed, but literally for, you know, years and years, I tried to figure out how to pay it for it. And I paid it for it in volunteering. And I, you know, did all, I did a lot of work on myself and, and, but when COVID hit and death was around us was real, it was when I really felt like I knew exactly what I wanted to do. And that was create a virtual space because I couldn't imagine going through the death of my son in the midst of COVID and all the things that, that added that layer to. And I figured out how can I help people? How can I reach people? Um, in a space that they feel comfortable, um, as well as it's virtual. Um, we can be in our pajamas, we can hang out, we can talk, we can, you know, be drinking wine, coffee, whatever, and just be around people that totally understand. And that's where Grief to Hope was born. Wow. I mean, what it's the, the whole story, it's like we have some, you know, first of all, the last Matthew, my Matthew was 25, and like, you got the knock on the door. I didn't, you mm -hmm. know, my, I was no knock at the door. Nobody came. I heard about what? it on the news. That's how I found out. And Horrible. literally I called the morgue because I saw it on the news. And the only thing I could think of was call the morgue. Cause you know, that's the only thing I could knew. To, maybe he'll be there. And then they told me that he was there. Like they didn't even identify who I was. And I've since found out they don't have to, anybody can call and ask. They get that information. It's just crazy that that happens. Crazy. Yeah. But what really blows my mind is like the police didn't even tell you, right? They're they're there, like they could have prepared you. They they're like, go make this phone call. You know, it's like really, yeah. like you could have yeah. given me that comfort and be like, okay, this is what you're gonna, this is who you need to call because this is what's happened. But I mm -hmm. guess because it's an investigation, it might have been why that was the case, right? And then, and then I just can't imagine, like, I'm sitting here picturing like. Going through all that and watching the person who took your son, like, just walk away. Like, mm -hmm. nothing, no no responsibility held, no nothing. It's like, you know, you make a conscious decision. I don't, you know, and I know about stand your ground. And yes, there are situations of that. And typically it's like somebody, you know, has a gun or, you know, it's, right. it's, it's, I feel like for me, and this is just my opinion, it, it gets a little used too much. Mm -hmm. You know, and people not to say get away with it, but it's, it's accepted too much. Right. And, right. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And I just, I can't imagine like going through all that time and first of all, you're grieving and then you got to go through a process of a, a possible trial and then watching that happen where he just walks away and you're left going, nobody's held accountable. My son's mm -hmm. not here anymore. I mean, mm -hmm. I just, I can't imagine that. For, and for me, that's where we also some celebrities like, you know, I, Matthew was at an intersection that was not well lit, stop signs you couldn't see, went right to the stop sign and hit the tree. And the first thing I asked was, did he die instantly? Like, I want, mm -hmm. you know, I was like, you, like, you want to go get him warm, right? I was like, right. okay, I, did he suffer? I hope he didn't suffer. Right. Like, we literally had talked to him five minutes before the accident happened. Like, uh, the one blessing for us is that we talked to him, 
probably a half hour before it happened because he butt dialed us by accident. We called and said, are you okay? And then, um, and then he's, you know, said he was, you know, getting an Uber and, and he was in my car, unfortunately. But then he, you know, goes to that stop sign. It's like, okay, they're responsible. And there's some actions that Matthew did too to let up to his accident, right? But, but then to go, nobody comes to your door to tell you. And then, mm-hmm. you know, so it's nine o'clock and the, the accident happened at 1230 in the morning, 930 a.m. I see it on the news. We are, we're heading to go pick up a rental car. My girlfriend's driving us to get a rental car and she calls and she gets home like about two hours later and says, Hey, his name's in the paper. I'm like, what? And nobody still had come to my door. Like I did not have anybody at my door. So that's Monday. Tuesday, we go through all the funeral stuff. Um, And Wednesday, my girlfriend calls and says, Hey, heads up. There's another article in the paper that says they're trying to get more information about the investigation. And I got mad. Yeah. I was like, okay. And it had the, the, the police officer's email. And I emailed them and I said, hey, because here's the thing. So everybody who's listening, understand this. He was in my car. His license was my address. My registration was my address. Everything pointed to our home here. And so I emailed him and I said, hey, I understand you want more information on this accident. I'm his mom. How would you feel if your mom found out in the news that you died? Right. And he literally picked up the phone and he called me and, and he's like, I don't know. You know, I, the stories I'm getting is, well, first we told, cause I live in a different County than where the accident happened. First he says, we told them. And so he didn't know I have friends that are on the sheriff's office here where I live. And I was uh-huh. like, can you look this up? And they're like, yeah, they sent it over, but they pulled it back. They told us not to go. You've been notified. I'm like, okay. So then I call and I, I call back, you know, even to this day, I, we, we're getting a runaround. Yeah. They violate the Marcy law because you're not supposed to put the name in the paper unless you've given next to kid notification. So right. they violated Marcy law. So, you know, we're falling through on some of those things to try to hold somebody accountable. And, you know, Matthew was mixed race. So we feel like there might be some underlining things there as well, because, you know, we, we were blessed to adopt him when he was a month old, but you know, those things, it's like, even like in that death, there's certain things you, but can I have something that you should be doing the right way? And you wonder, you know, where's the, where, where's the accountability and all, right? So where's the accountability? Absolutely. The compassion I found is, is exactly like what you found. Like there was different pieces. Like literally I had never been through a tragic kind of death, nor have I planned a, a funeral by any means. And so literally the morgue's like, just like you said, they're like, well, you need to get a hold of a funeral home to come and get him if you want to see him. And so calling funeral homes, I felt like I was buying a used car. They're like, well, you have to have $10,000 for me to go get him. I'm like, who has $10,000 readily available? I know I don't. I have life insurance. I have savings. I have retirement. But I can't just like walk into the bank and get those, right? And um, I literally called two other funeral homes and I felt like I was planning a party or a deposit needed to be done. That's the way I felt. Um, and we had talked about this before, but it finally came to a funeral home that says, we'll figure it out. We'll go get them. And that's all I wanted. I just, I had this just desire to get him out of, I felt like this cold, dark, alone place. And I wanted him out of that, you know, into something. I kept thinking just a warm kind of cozy place that I could go and see him and hold him. Um, or at least hold his hand or whatever. And so, yeah, I completely understand their compassion. Who not there. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, when you talk about the funeral homes and everything, we were very blessed. So we have a nonprofit here. It's called the Angel Foundation here in Brandon, Florida area. And they help families in catastrophic situations. And I, you know, Chuck and I, we've donated because we believe in it. We love giving back to our community. And they literally, like, all I did was call her and say, Hey, I've had four French kids in my house. They're going to get picked up tonight. I know I'm going to have a lot of family coming in. I just need my house clean. I mean, I'll pay for it. I didn't want any hands out. Right. And like, we got you, we got you. Right. And they, they took care of us, but that was the one thing we had different. And I'm sorry you went through that because they put us with 
a funeral home here in here in Brandon, Florida. It's called Hillsborough Dignity Memorial. And they put us with CJ and his team. And like Tuesday, when we went to go sit down with him, we still, like I said, still no phone call. Right. I've not seen him. I don't know how to go see him and all that, like right. you were saying, right? And I'm just like, I was like, you, I just want him to be, make sure he still feels loved. I, you know, I don't want him sitting in a, in a drawer somewhere, right? Right. right. Like, yeah. That's all I could think of was like sitting in a drawer. And so CJ goes, You haven't seen him? You don't know? I'm like, I have no clue what his body's, I have no clue what yes. damage or anything. He's like, Hold on. We have 15 minutes left. Hold on. And he was so amazing. And, you know, and that's what you want. Like, you want somebody that's going to be, like, compassionate. And then the flip side of that, the next day, so talk about all those costs, right? So you got yeah $13,000 to take care of the service part. And then, you know, I really didn't want to cremate him. And God bless my mom. She was able to help us. And so we didn't have to cremate him. But then you got that part. So here's my almost 23-year-old son taking me to go to the car because we've got to get personal effects out of the car. And he gets in the car. He's like... What was that highway robbery yesterday? <laughs> and I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, oh, $23,000? You know, and a part of that, of course, is Chuck and I bought our plots because we're like, we need to be buried next to him sometime right. in the long future, hopefully. And I'm right. like, I'm like, what do you mean? I'm like, Nate, you can't. He goes, there's no payment plans or anything like that. And I'm like, no, son, think about it this way. If you buy a new car, you don't make your car payment. They can't repossess the body. <laughs> right, right. You're exactly right. I And then once you're in there, then you want the best. Like this is your final gift to your son. So then you, you don't want to like cut corners. Huh? Right. And so, you know, they present you these gorgeous things and you're like, okay, that one's the best. So I'm going to go with that one. And for, instead of, you know, my son, I can see literally because he's he was cheap. I can literally see, see him saying, are you kidding, mom? That's what you're, you're, you're spending money on. Um, because I wanted to have this beautiful, uh, it was a mural, mural put on his vault. And so, um, you know, I spent the extra money for that and then people got to sign it. And, and anyways, cool. but you know, I can just, I can really see him saying, you know, mom, that, that doesn't matter. But, it's funny you say that because those ain't so when you talk about as you're going through this, like you know, you're in an immediate fog, right? You yes. are like you're literally just walking through the day, the hour, the minute, the second, because you you know, yeah. this is like first of all, you're like, I'm not supposed to bury my kid, you know. So yes. you got that. And then it's like, did this really happen? Like, am I in a dream? Right. And the one thing I have a blessing is I have an old boss, Jim Macklin in, in Virginia, and he called like when he found out, he called me right away. He goes, Okay, listen. This is what you can expect when you walk in. They're going to want to sell you this, 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 and this. So be prepared. Like he told me, you don't need this, this, and this, and this. You just need this. And I'm like, okay. And like he had, it, it was so, you guys are going to laugh. Listeners are going to laugh. Even that my son's old babysitters, when they were babies in Virginia, we, we still keep in contact. She even called me. She said, you know, you can get a casket from Costco. So I go, <laughs> I go into this meeting, like I've gone on Costco and I've looked at everything, right? And I go in this meeting and I tell CJ and the team, well, I think we can get this cut. He goes, don't say it. And I say, what do you mean? He goes, Costco, right? And I'm like, yeah. And he goes, first of all, when they're in the ground, what they're buried in does matter. I'm like, okay. I didn't realize that, but okay. So once he walked me through that, I'm like, okay. I go, but listen, I told him, I go, I ain't paying for a wedding in a casket. I told him. It's like, okay, I got you covered, you know? And then, and then it was funny. So then we were doing the food because they provide some meals during the wake, you know, cause they have it there. And, um, and he, I said to my son, I said, Nate, we'll let you pick up the food. And he's like, he's looking at he, my son is, we used to call him Saturday night live. He's such a big, yeah. and he looks at, it, he goes, I think yogurt and eggs are good enough for Matthew. <laughs> I was like, oh my God. You know, you know so, that just cracks me up. Well, one thing is that you have two beautiful souls that called you and prepared you for that. Yeah. When you walk in blindly, the worst thing about grief is there's so many surprises and you are not in the frame of mind to be like contemplating decisions. So bless those friends that called you and said, listen, because I'm telling you, I had like the brass corners on the casket or sterling. Stuff. I mean, it was ridiculous. And I didn't know any better. And I, and I 
if I go shopping, like I'm the coupon queen. So if I know that I could have went to Costco, <laughs> my son's probably going, thanks mom. But you know what I mean? That's like, you go in there and you're blindsided. You don't have no you, idea. You're clueless. I, we were really blessed. So not only those two, but the foundation, like my girlfriend, cause she lost her dad in the past like year. So she came with us to the kind of be like that take notes. Cause she said, I know um, things are going to go over your head. So she took notes and like, I forgot about the, the thumbprint and things like that we could order. And then the foundation, Lisa, who also works for the um, funeral home, she lost her son nine years ago um, up north somewhere. And so she was like, so she could understand what we were walking through. So she's been a, a blessing. We've been, God has definitely put people around us to help yes. us understand these things that we're going through. So, yeah. you know, so, okay. So we're kind of laughing about some of this stuff, which is, you know, right. good because, you know, there are, there are different stages of grief and for everybody who's out there that's written those books, God bless you. But I don't believe in just, there's all those stages. I think there's more than the stages you see in these books. Right. Yeah. And so, so, you know, you, we come through this, like I, we were talking earlier when we're on, like what, when did your son pass again? November of 2016. 16. So it's been right. six years. Gotcha. And I'm five months heading, heading yeah. into six months. And so you know, we were talking before we came on the air about the different stages. And I was sharing with you the story about how, you know, like I had a retreat in September. Matt passed in July. We buried the end of July. We buried him the first week in August. I did my retreat. I had people go, I can't believe you're doing that retreat. I'm like, I need that retreat just as much as for me as from the ladies coming. But then mm -hmm. people were going, you're so strong. You're, you know, I can't believe you're doing this. Can't believe you're doing that. I mean, I went to Syracuse and had the city of Syracuse named after me, you know, shortly after Matt wow. passed. Wow. Yeah, it was really awesome. And I traveled, but, and then like I was telling you earlier before we hopped on was that I also got an award that was in Vegas and a friend of mine happened to be there too, getting an award at the same event. And we were talking the other day, her and I, and I was like, I, like I was sharing with you before that I'd seen this article talked about grief fog. So like there's this gr fog from the grief you're going through. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's what I've been feeling. Like, I feel like I'm getting up out of bed. I'm doing the things I'm supposed to do because like you said, my son, Matt saw me, he would often say, mom, so-and-so did this to you or that happened to you. How do you stay like so positive? And I used to tell him, I have to have my glass full because if I, it's not full, I can't take care of you. So like you said earlier, why do I change my life now? Because he's not here. That's not who I am. And that's in my mind since July, that's what I feel like I was doing. But now that I understand the grief fog, it's like, okay, I was trying to fill my cup and I, in my head, I thought I was filling my cup, but I was really letting this fog keep me from filling my cup. Right. And so now that I understand what it is, it's like, okay, I can label that feeling. I know what that feeling is. So when it creeps up again, and I feel like I'm just existing because my friend said, Pearl, when I went to that event with you, I saw you get the award. It was like, you were there, but you were staring off in space. Like you, yeah. you weren't there, you know? And so yeah. Talk to us about some of the things so you're working and you've got this amazing group. And I think it's awesome because I feel like we need those type of groups for us to understand, you know, we're not alone. It's there's the life before you, you're lost as a loved one. And now there's a life after. Right. And then not feeling guilty for living the life mm -hmm. after and finding joy, even though there's sadness and, you know, heaviness of it. So talk to us and share us a little bit about what's what's it like to be in part of your group and what can somebody expect if they were to reach out to you and said tell me more i love that um and grief fog is so real um we talked about that as well and this is one of the things that's great about my program is first of all it's free um it's a seven week program the first week we come together and it's an introduction it's sort of like how i'm talking telling you my story why my why um, and I believe that, that in this, in the program, one of the things that's great about it is we do, we respect each other no matter what you're, who you're grieving. If it's suicide, if it's a, an illness, is it your son? Is it your grandmother that lived a great life? That doesn't matter. It's, it's whoever. Um, we don't put levels or severity or anything like that on there. Um, and we welcome and respect all opinions and thoughts. And, and beliefs as far as religious beliefs and those kind of things as well, because I think that needs to be an open area too, because that can sometimes stop people from attending. 
Um, but one of the things that we do in the first group is, is we just open up and introduce ourselves. I introduce me um, and my story. And then if you want to introduce and tell your story, great. If you want to be on camera, great. If you just want to listen, that's great too. Just being there around others and, and sharing your story has so much impact on other people that we have no idea. So, you know, just speaking from example, one person came on and never turned her camera on, never spoke the whole program. Weeks. But there was one lady on there that had um, her son had committed suicide and she was there. I found out later from the same. And so she went through the whole seven week program. And then the greatest thing is you can come and go. You can come in week one, two, three. If life happens, come back. It's not you don't have to be there all seven weeks. Um, we'd love for you to, but you don't have to. Life happens. Um, but then she came back um, the next program and turned on her camera and talked. And she basically said, if it wasn't for that person and I felt that connection, her and I, that she lost her son and I was going through those same things. I had to listen for the seven weeks and I couldn't talk. But now I feel like I'm ready to share my story and impact somebody. So it's just, it's amazing group. Um, it's very open. It's very relaxed atmosphere. But like I said, the first week is introductions. Um, the second, the two through six week, we spell out the word grief. So I do a main topic. So it sort of just sparked the conversation. The first topic is G for gift of time. We talk about how time helps, how time doesn't help, how people expect you to hurry up or how people expect you to be over with it, you know, in time limit. And then the next one is R is receive help. How do you receive help? How do you ask for help? Um, I is for inspire, which is what we we're talking about, like laughing and those kind of things we think is taboo. And that is not what this is about. Grief to Hope is about finding that inspiration, however big or small it is, to get you out of bed in the morning and keep you moving forward. And a lot of times that fog takes over, but if you have that focus, that really helps you determine your day and control your day. So inspiration is huge when it comes to grief to hope. And then E is expectations. We have expectations, right? I expected people to be a little more compassionate than they were. Um, and, you know, they have expectations too. Like, okay, Hope, it's been two years. Shouldn't you be done and over with this and not talk about it, right? And then F is feel everything. And I love how this has morphed over the sessions. But F is feel everything. And we do, we bring pictures, we share stories, we bring memories, we talk about what pizza toppings they like. We just, we have a lot of fun with that. And then the last session is to hope. And that's simply what that inspiration is or what's your next steps moving forward. And we just want you to really have a plan of what you want to do and what you want to accomplish before we meet up the next group. And that's it. Very relaxed, very, very, uh, you know, open, honest. We're transparent. You don't have to wear that grief mask and say, I'm okay. Um, you don't have to come and say, um, you know, this really felt like crap. And I don't want one more person to say how they can help me because they really don't care. You know, just that openness of we get it. We understand. And that's really what Grief to Hope's all about. And, and I think it's so powerful too that that what you're doing because I don't I I, mean, I found journals and things like that but I've and really the cool thing is Lisa here has started and I've actually um want to connect you guys together she's she has started a group for parents um a, you know a grief group just for parents and um mm -hmm. I went to that I went to the one of my first meetings I was able to go to and there was a lady there who you know and and I told her like she's like I don't know if I'm gonna come to this again because it's so emotional. And I listened to her story and I was like, I hope you come back again because you showed me that even 16 years later, the grief is still going to creep up on you and you're going to feel like this. And I'm glad, you know, I told her, I was glad that you came and you shared what you shared and you, you were open and vulnerable with us. And you said, this is how my life really is. Sometimes it, it sucks sometimes, yes. you know? Yes. And, and I was like, you made me feel good to know that I, I get that. And I told her, I said, and I hope I can inspire you to say, you know, 
it, the glass can be full. It may not be completely full, but it can be full if we just work at it and really understand that when the grief comes up, you know, and I'm not a grief coach and, you know, I'm definitely referring people to you and to, and the, the locally here to Lisa for coming in person to these things. But I, I really feel like, you know, having something like this tells me, you know, like I said before, there's a world before and the world after and, and learning yeah. how to live in both and enjoying the before, you know, I, I told somebody the other day, I was like, I was in the public getting some, um, something at the deli and I was standing there and all of a sudden I just started crying and mm -hmm. the, the poor guy. He did something wrong. And he's like, are you okay? Did, I'm like, he hadn't even served me yet. I'm like, no, 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 I'm fine. I'm like, I'm just having a moment. It's it's okay, you know? And like mm -hmm. last night at an event, you know, I was talking about something about Matthew and and I started crying, you know, and she, she gave me a hug. She goes, it's okay. I go, I know. And and I knew she understood it because she's lost um, two husbands in the past, you know, a few years. And so I was like, you know, and I'm, I just tell everybody, I'm like, and I've heard people say, I have a friend on Facebook, even today she posted it again, that people said, oh, you said a minute ago, you better, you, can't you get over it? It's been a while. Can't you get past it? And I told my husband, I go, I pity the soul that ever says that to me. So if you're listening and you're my friend, don't say it to me because I'll go, I'll probably go to jail because I'll probably punch him <laughs> and it won't be, and it, you can call it self-defense, whatever you want to call it, but it's going to yeah. be like, I'm going to punch you, you know, but, right. you know, but tell me too. So one of the things that, um, and I think the program is great and everybody's listening. We're going to make sure you get links and everything to Hope's program, but I want to kind of do a little shift, right? Yeah. Cause I feel like in our grief, we give so much to that loved one of our grief. Like our grief is so much about them. Right. And, we have to make sure, and, and cause you know, I'm, I, I believe in making sure you're a shearer of your self care. How have you found, like, have you had struggles going, I need to take care of me and I used to love to do this and I need to get back to it. Right. Have you had some of those struggles and do you have any examples you can share with us? I love that. I love that because I call it hope version 2.0. I had version point 1.0 uh, before Justin, and then now I'm 2.0. And life for hope before was I was always Miss Positive, Sunshine Roses, Jokester, have, you know, right. And so I never had a bad day. And if I did, nobody knew about it and that kind of thing. And um, then when this happened, that's when I had to make those choices because I didn't like that ugly place I was living in and that hatred. And I think one of the greatest things was I didn't have to go through the trial. And I think that God really connected me with like, you don't have to, I, I'm not going to put you through it. I have bigger things I need you to focus on. So I think that was a blessing, even though he's not paying for it in that kind of sense. I had to let that go because he's not thinking of Hope Rieger. He's not thinking of Justin. He's not even worrying about what I'm doing or who I'm doing or what I'm doing. Neither. Um, and maybe he is giving a thought to my son. I don't know. But none of that matters to me because I had to figure out as I'm grieving, you have this guilt. And I know that you'll feel it. it the laughter. I, we shouldn't be laughing. And even you said, I know you guys think we're crazy because we're laughing. And that's one of the things that I knew that Justin would be devastated if he caused my life to be um, a negative and ugly place because that was never what I was about. And so one of the things that's been very hard for me to learn is forgiveness um, and patience and putting myself in a place where I know what makes me feel good. And exercise, I tell people this, this quote kind of thing, it's day one or one day. And I use it all the time because day one means today. One day means tomorrow. And we eventually run out of those tomorrows, right? Like those tomorrows keep happening, but we'll eventually run out of those. And Justin did. And so my, my whole self-focus is on today.
and what I can do today for hope and what I can do today for Justin. And so that's what inspires me to get out of bed. That's what inspires me to go to the gym, which I hate. You know, you get to the gym. I always tell people I'm looking like I'm pissed off when I go into the gym, but I'm happy coming out because it's done. Um, But eating right, I had to quit smoking. And people said, you quit smoking six months after Justin died. What were you thinking? And I said, I knew I had to do it for me to feel better and accomplished. And I don't think people realize that the point of feeling accomplished in something really puts you in a place. And serving others and helping others, it really puts you in that place of just, it's just the best feeling in the world. And so I tell people all the time that, you, you know, I'm not strong. I'm not courageous. I'm not a hero. I'm not like, and I hear this all the time. You hear, I'm sure you've heard this. If it was me, I wouldn't make it. I hear that all the time. And I say, you know what? You don't have a choice because their life is now your life. They didn't get to live their life. You get to live it for them. So that's why you push on and that's why you make progress and that's why you move forward. So that was the greatest gift that was ever from this is that I, I can't, today's the day, not tomorrow. Yeah, you're right. You're courageous. You're strong or all this stuff. It's like, no, I'm not. I mean, I, you know, and people tell me that. And the best thing I love, like I had a friend yesterday, she was, I just didn't call you because I didn't know what to say. I go, I wish you would call me and just said that. Because right. I would rather you call me and say, Pearl, I don't know what to say, but how can I support you? Then ignore me and think, and I make me start thinking, wow, they don't care about me. Right. And I knew she cared. And then be like, or, or say something cliche, just like what you said. Oh, if it was me, I could never make it. Well, you're right. You, you don't have a choice. I mean, you have a choice. You can choose to sit in that moment the rest of your life, that day that that loved one passed. And, you know, and somebody had asked me one time, do you, do you think Matt could commit suicide? And I said, I know he didn't. I know he did because with even with all the anxiety and depression he went through, that was always the one thing he would say to us because he did lose a friend of suicide. He goes, I will never, ever do that because I don't want to leave you two behind with that feeling of what, you know, of what could we have done? Anything else like that? He goes, I will never. Do I said, so I know he didn't do that. I know this was unintentional because of the conversations we were having leading up, you know? Yeah. So I said, I know that that's not the case, but it's like, you're right. It's like the cliches of, you know, I could never. Well, you're right. You It, it truly is a choice to everybody's listening. You can choose. I could have choose to live at that 930 a.m. the rest of my life. Every yeah. morning could have been 930 a.m. on July 25th. Or yes. I could choose. And, and the thing is, is, you know, we have other family. And in, in our cases, we have other children. It's like mm-hmm. we we can't live like, you know, Matt struggled with stuff. So Nate always lived in the shadow of, OK, what's happening with Matt today? What's happening with Matt today? The last thing I want to do is let Nate live in Matt's shadow of grief. You yes. know, I don't want him to live in the grief of Matthew. And so I've tried to really, you know, separate. And I've told him, you know, listen, there's going to be times it's going to come up and, you know, you just got to work with through it. And just like through the grief fog, I, I must ask him something 10 times. And he's like, I don't think we want a vacation with you because all, you know, <laughs> so it's like, <laughs> you know, but, but it is that. And you're, I mean, you're right. It's a choice. And so we have to choose. We have to make sure we do those things for ourselves that we did before. And I love it too, too about paying it forward. And this is a really cool story. So Thanksgiving was coming up and Matt's girlfriend, Brittany and I, we were, we went to go put some um, stuff. My, my mother, I love my mom. She insisted <laughs> that Matthew had all these angels. So we ordered like five different angels that, that are LED lit, right? They're solar power. Yeah. He needs lights around him. He needs angels around because he doesn't have a headstone. Yet. I'm like, okay. So I put all these there and we put one at the tree where he, where he passed. And so Brittany and I went up there to go put them there. And there was a green covering, like there was going to be another funerals coming up, like right across from Matthew. And there was something about when I when we were there, I kept telling Brittany, I go, I don't know what's up. I don't know who's getting ready to be buried there, but there's something about that spot. I don't know what it is, but I feel like something's pulling me. And so Thanksgiving night came and, you know, we weren't able to go away. So I said to Chuck, I'm going to go over See if I can see the, you know, the lights at night. And I can tell my mom and I'll take a picture. Well, in Florida, we have this thing called no see They like bite you, but you can't see them. They're not mosquitoes. They just like pick at you and bite you. They feel like a mosquito. So I oh, go no. to sit down. Oh my gosh. I go to sit down and sit with Matthew and they're like attacking me. But I turn around and look 
And I know what he did. He was having them attack me for a reason. I turn yeah. around, look, and the green thing's gone, and the marker is there. They put the little marker down for you with your name on it. And I said, let me go see if I can see the name. I couldn't see the name. <laughs> so it was getting too dark. I'm like, okay, fine. So that Monday after Thanksgiving, I had to go up there to pick up his thumbprint. I thought, I'm going to go there and see if I can see the person's name. Yeah. Well, she was 28 years old, a mom. And um, I saw the name and I thought, the name sounds familiar, but I, in my head, I'm going 28, three years old in Matthew. I wonder if Matt knew her. Maybe that's why I was feeling that calling to the graveside. Yeah. So me being the private investigator I used to do when they were kids, I'm going to go on Facebook and find <laughs> their friends. Well, I found out that two of his friends, one an old roommate and one an old friend from school, knew the the husband of the girl that was buried there. And so they called to tell me that, unfortunately, she died in childbirth. It was so sad. 28 years old, died in childbirth, and the baby was had just came home from NICU. So I I call, I got I said, can you please ask him to, you know, is it okay if I can reach out to him? And so I reached out to him and I told him the story about how I just felt called there. And I said, listen, I want you to know I'm going to take one of the angels at Matt's grave. I'm going to put it where your wife is at because I don't want you to think anybody stole it from Matt's graveside and put it over there, number one. And number right. two, I feel like she's an angel and she's watching over you and these kids. And, and I'm like, what do you need? And he's like, I don't need nothing. I go, no, you're 28 years old. You've got two beautiful kids. You need something. And he's with, he's with his parents right now. And so he's like, all I need is somebody to help pay off the lease car that was in her name so he could keep the car. So we have the Angel Foundation. We did the whole thing. But I told him, I said, I don't know what it was, but something was just calling me there. So I think like what you said earlier, we have to to honor our loved one. And I felt like Matthew was telling me because he he would tell all his friends I had problems. Go talk to my mom. She knows what to do. She knows people that he would tell her. So I felt like that time of Thanksgiving, he's like, mom, they need your help. Turn around, turn around. Right. And people go, you're crazy. I'm like, I don't care what you say. I believe that they're around me. I believe he's telling me things. And so, I, you yeah. know, so I really feel like, like you were saying, like with the grief to hope, like finding a way to do something to pace in their honor, like that's what they want us to do. And anybody that's listening, that's what your loved ones when they leave her. That's what they want us to do. That's what God wants us to do. That's what whoever you believe in spiritually, that's what we are here for. We're not just here to be selfish and not give back. We should have compassion. And I think too, with everything going on in this world right now, if we could have a little bit of paying it forward of yeah. the rewards we've had, can you imagine what kind of country or world we would be in? Much better than what we are right now. But would you okay. not agree, like finding a way, like you've got the grief to hope, but finding things, and I'm sure, do you have signs that come around from him? So it's just, when you're telling me that story, the only thing that keeps running through my mind is like, she lost her, you know, her baby, but now she, maybe she's mothering your son, right? Maybe she's now his mom up in heaven. You know, that's what dawns on me when, you know, she, anyways, uh, yeah, all the time. Um, you know, I tell the story that, um, listen, paying it forward was something big because I sort of like screamed out to God one time and I said, okay, listen, you took Justin from me. I need to know what am I supposed to be doing because I need something to focus on. I need something to, you know, and I just, I heard the words Pearl and I don't know if it came on the radio. I don't know, but I heard the words, just be kind. And I tell this story in my book because one of the things is I'm like, be kind. I'm kind. I'm nice. Like, what does that mean? And so I, and that's all I've ever heard. And so I put forth extra effort into kindness because of what I heard, but, you know, I would pay it forward. Um, I, you know, volunteer, I pay, you know, I do everything I could to create this kindness atmosphere. And one time I was in a coffee drive through and I don't drink coffee, but um, I was getting a, soda or something anyways um and i was like i'm gonna pay it forward you know how they pay for the guy behind you and i thought i'm gonna pay it forward and um and this guy's you know just behind me i'm like how much could he possibly <laughs> you know how expensive can this be and i'm thinking wait a minute he'll be like buying for the office like the donuts <laughs> for the office but i'm like okay i'm just you know, so I get up there and there's only one lot or only one window. So I asked, I asked the cashier, I was like, I want to pay for the guy behind me, you know, and this is pretty fresh with Justin. And 
Um, so I, you know, I'm sort of tearing up about it and, and I'm just like, just hurry up, take my card. And he, I, he tells me the amount and I look, and I, as I look over his name tag said, Justin, which is my son's name. And just the ironic of, uh, you know, the cashier to have that name in the midst of it. So right then and there, I knew in my heart, and it has stayed with me that paying it forward doesn't necessarily mean paying for everybody because we all can't afford to keep doing that. But it's just about helping others that who knows what that guy was going through on that particular day that that put me in that sequence of cars. But that's the whole point of giving back and, and sharing and the feeling that you get. I tell everybody that it wasn't about going on you know, Facebook and saying, hey, I paid for the guy on, you know, at Tim Hortons. It was that feeling in my heart that that was exactly what I was supposed to be doing at that time. I, I love that and that sign of Justin's name there. That's so it's so powerful. And you, I mean, you're right. It's it's all about we we can't give everything out of our pocket, but there's ways right. we can give kindness. There's ways we can do things in in honor of of them. And I think it's I think it's so powerful. It's one of the things that we decided to do is every July because the one big thing we found, and I like I like what you said earlier about you don't know about your tomorrows. One of the big things we found was. Matt's phone, somebody tried to help me unlock it. It got locked. I couldn't reach all his friends. Like uh, he had over 200 people in, in between the two days that were there, but I couldn't reach all his friends. So I had two of his friends show up at my door within a week after he, after he's buried. I was like, I was trying to get a touch with Matthew. And I was like, oh my gosh. So I literally, it was like, I created the, 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 it was the month of July is hashtag make the call for Matt. So call somebody. So if you're listening to this right now, that person you're thinking of right this second going, I haven't called them in a little while. Pick up the phone and call them or text them and say, Kay, can you talk? Because I'm telling you, you don't know if you're going to wake up tomorrow or if they're going to wake up tomorrow. So it's really important that, you know, I, I really want to say that. So if you get anything from this today is that, you know, you're not promised tomorrow. You don't know when your dash is going to end. So take care of that dash in between those numbers and, mm-hmm. you know, and make sure you're making that phone call. Um, funny story. We did Matt's, um, we designed his headstone. And so we had to order ours with it because right now granite's so expensive. Like order yours too. And we'll put it up there. I'm like, oh, wait a minute. I want no name on it. I want no date of birth. It just needs to be a blank stone next to Matthew. You are <laughs> not jinxing me. <laughs> right, not right. Jinxing you know, because, because granted it's so expensive. That's why they said order it now. Cause you don't know. I'm like, okay, fine. So, but this has been so much fun. And if you are listening and you know, you've lost a loved one or you lost a child, you know, all the links and everything are going to be here for hope. And for myself, you know, reach out because you're not alone. you, may feel like you're alone because I know I felt like I was alone, but I can tell you, you're not alone. And you'd be amazed how many people around you are going through it and they just don't talk about it. And that's why Hope is doing the courses she's doing. That's why I'm sharing things like this on my platform. So just want you to know that you're not alone. And Hope, it's been awesome having you here today. And and Hope's watched the show, so she knows I also <laughs> forewarn her. that. Um, and so for all of our listeners, you can't see this. And on our radio show, you won't be able to see it either. But you can, you'll can, you be able to join in on us. We have these, these cards. They're called Better Questions, Better Life. I get no commission on these cards. But if you go online, it's a great, it's a great gift for any occasion. Um, but they're basically cards that my friend Diane Allen and Carol Gill put together. There, I think there are 70 cards here and you just pull a card out every day and you just journal about it or you read it or whatever, whatever it does to motivate your day. But so Hope's going to tell me when to stop shuffling and she's going to answer one of the questions. So here we go. Uh, stop. All right. So before we answer the question, Hope, tell everybody where they can find you on social media and any other things you want to share with them about your course. Absolutely. You can reach out and find me at my website, www.grief2hopesupport.com. Um, I'm on Facebook, Hope Rieger, Grief to Hope's on Facebook. Grief to Hope is on Instagram, and we are Hope Rieger, Grief to Hope on LinkedIn. And I am thinking about TikTok, but I'm not sure. <laughs> 
I know you talked about that, so I'm not sure if I'm hip to that yet, but yes, but on my website, you can find everything. And we'll make sure we post everything, everybody. Yeah. My lovely coach, Julie DeLuca Collins pushed me to be on, on, uh, TikTok and uh, I'm loving it now, but I fought it hard. (laughs) So so Hope's question, and I think I know the answer because we've kind of talked about this a lot today, but are you thinking for yourself? Absolutely. So that's one of the things that drives my, um, I call it my uh, devastation to determination. And it's what gets me out of bed. And I live for myself and my son. And I try to make every minute count in every single day. And I love what you said, like, what's my dash? I hope that my dash means something to my my kids, my family, um, and most of all to the world. And I see that. I see what you're doing and what you're bringing to the world. I, I definitely see that dash is definitely empowering and and making people smile. So thank you so much for being on today. And so those that are listening and or watching us on YouTube, you can get us on YouTube at Conversations with Pearl. But I just want to remind you that. Every week we have this amazing community of women. It's called the Shiro League. And if you want to know more information, if you want to just drop in and visit us Sunday nights, 8 p.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern time, you can come in and join us for free. And it's just an hour. It's a great way to end your week, great way to start your week, all on Zoom. So you can wear PJs and no makeup if you want. And you can let the girls hang loose. I don't care. But we just have a great time. We support one another. We talk about things that are coming up, things we're trying to overcome. And we even have guest speakers that come in and um, we've had, speaking of grief, uh, this, I think this will air afterwards, but we have Seth Santoro with the Smile Method. So while we're talking about grief, go check him out. Again, Seth Santoro, he's amazing. And um, I just want to remind everybody that you come into this world, you're a little rough on the outside. You've got this shell of an oyster on the outside. But as you open up and you really start to find yourself, you have that inner pearl of greatness. So I hope you go out and find your inner pearl of greatness. And if you need more information, you can reach us at pearl at wsliving.com. Have a great day.